Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us here on this. What looks like a sunny day where I live anyways, which is nice to have. My name is Katie Earl. I'm the coordinator of the University Express program and I work for the Erie County Department of Senior Services. And we're joined here virtually today with Valerie Stonick and we're super appreciative of her time because this is a very important topic and we're glad you can all be here with us. So before we jump into her presentation, and if you've seen me before, you know I'm going to do some housekeeping stuff because again, we have some new folks here with us. So you just heard me say that we are recording this presentation and if all goes as planned, I'll try to post it on our website in the near future. For those of you who are brand new today, you've already noticed that you've joined muted and without your video showing, and that's not because you've done anything wrong. Those are just the settings for our program here today. You also might think you're the only person here in attendance with us, but as you've heard me say, we have other people in here. It's just we're in an anonymous participation mode. So if you have any questions throughout Valerie's program or any comments, please type those into your Q&A panel right away so you don't forget, and we'll try to get to as many as we can in the time that we have here this morning. How do you access that? So if you're on a laptop or computer, look on the right hand side of your WebEx window, you might see Q&A, you just have to expand it, then you'll see your text box and you can send your questions right to me. If you're not seeing that up there right now, if you look in the lower right hand corner of your WebEx screen, you might see a square with a question mark and Q&A, click on that to expand it. Or if you're on a tablet or smartphone, poke or touch your screen, that will bring up your control panel. You'll see a circle with three dots. Click on that and then you'll see Q&A. So we hope you participate. I'd like to thank the sponsors of our program, which is my Department of Senior Services, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York, Excelsior Orthopedics, and Wegmans for everything they help do to make this program possible. And as always, please do not hesitate to contact us at Senior Services. We work for you and we're happy to help. If you have questions about program services or benefits for yourself or a loved one, give us a call. We're at 858-8526. And I will introduce our instructor today. Valerie is an attorney practicing in the area of wills, trusts, estates, and elder law. In addition to practicing law, Valerie is a certified financial planning professional focusing on investments, retirement, and estate and long-term care planning. She lives with her husband and her Morky Elfie in their newly emptied nest in Amherst. Valerie, it's all yours. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Katie, and uh, thank everybody for, uh, for joining us today. Um, this topic seems to be very timely right now. I'm getting a lot of questions from a lot of clients and and uh, and general people that that I know in regards to putting their affairs in order. Um, this presentation is going to be about making sure that you have what you need um, and also that your loved ones can find it if something should happen to you. Uh, these days, again, with uh, you know with pandemics running rampant across the country. Um, People seem to be particularly uh, interested in this subject. However, when someone says putting their affairs in order, uh, sometimes people are not exactly sure what that includes or what it entails. So that's a big part of what this presentation is going to um, address. So we're gonna talk about putting your affairs in order. Uh, we're gonna talk about what that is. Um, we're going to specifically go into uh, the, the, the legal documents that you may need, depending on your situation. We're going to talk about your wishes regarding medical care and different uh, documents that address those. Um, we're going to talk about uh, funeral and burial wishes and how you uh, communicate and where you would communicate the, um, uh, your, your desires in regards to those topics. Uh, we're going to talk about assets and debts and uh, the various um, uh, things that you need to be aware of in regards to them. Uh, we will bring up a list of the miscellaneous documents that you may have thought of, uh, but that you may not have thought of uh, to make sure that you have those on hand. And uh, we're going to also talk about your online presence and in this day and age, um, how you need to address uh, passing on information about your uh, online presence to your heirs. Um, and then we're going to have a, a section where we kind of put it all together. So let's start with the concept of putting your affairs in order. So anyone who has, has uh, participated in a presentation with me knows that I have the very annoying habit of, uh, uh, of answering questions with, uh, uh, with beginning with the words, it depends. And this is no different. 
It definitely depends on your circumstances, what putting your affairs in order means to you. Uh, it depends on what your net worth is. So if I'm talking to a client who uh, uh, has a combined, you know, thirty million dollars uh, between um, uh, the the it, between each spouse, um, then we're going to have a completely different conversation about putting your affairs in order. Um, in addition, if I'm talking to somebody who owns a business or has a, um, a closely held uh, corporation, uh, that's going to be a completely different conversation, of course. Um, and putting your affairs in order, of course, becomes much more complicated. Um, if we're talking about the, the general um, uh, in, in family that I'm usually talking to, then the conversation is a lot more straightforward, but there's still a lot of moving parts and a lot of things that you need to be aware of. Uh, putting your affairs in, all, in order also depends on your family members. As you can imagine, uh, to set things up for uh, end of life planning, for someone who has an extended family, who has children and grandchildren um, and, and where things are uh, uh, quite extended and there are quite a few people involved uh, is, is one set of circumstances. The other set of circumstances, of course, is when I'm talking to someone who doesn't have any family at all. And uh, you know they are single, uh, their siblings have passed away, they've never had children. Uh, that type of, of planning is completely different as well. It is nonetheless uh, extremely important for that individual because usually um, people who, who meet that description have either friends or um, charities that they definitely want to see receive their assets when they pass away. It also depends on the nature of your assets. If I'm talking to somebody who has a lot of, whoops, I keep touching the wrong button, excuse me. The nature of your assets means um, if you have a lot of real estate, putting your affairs in order is very different than if you have savings accounts and CDs and items of that nature. Um, putting your affairs in, in order also depends very largely on your values and your goals and objectives. Uh, so, for example, I may have someone who tells me that what I really want to do is minimize any income taxes from paying out uh, IRAs at my passing. I want to minimize estate taxes if my net worth is high enough for estate taxes to be a concern. Um, so minimizing taxes is is one of the, the, the goals and objectives that you might have. Uh, you might have as a goal to provide for nursing home costs and to, to do that either by making your assets available in the proper uh, order and in the proper process to make them available for nursing home costs or to preserve your assets in the event of, of a nursing home stay by um, by doing some planning for the qualification uh, for Medicaid long-term care benefits. So sometimes that is a very, very important um, uh, planning goal. Another goal can be to protect your assets from creditors. Um, if you are, for example, a doctor uh, and you're concerned about your personal assets being, uh, you know, being in uh, being vulnerable to a malpractice lawsuit at some point in the future, there are ways of protecting your assets from that eventuality. There are other people who need to be concerned about creditors as well. Certainly, uh, people again who own businesses. Um, you know, if you are particularly vulnerable in any way to liability suits, then you want to protect your assets from creditors. But the other thing, just for the you know, just for the, the the majority of us, if you have health insurance that has any type of limit on the amount of um, uh, benefit that you can receive, the maximum benefit that you can receive over your lifetime, then you have the potential for uh, a significant. Um, medical debt. So that's that's true of, of, of most of us. Um, some people are very concerned about reducing probate expenses. Uh, there are, are probate expenses to be considered. Uh, there are also uh, there's also the delay associated with probate. So for anyone who isn't familiar with the probate process, if you pass away with or without a will, any of your assets that are not 
set up to pass outside of probate. So anything that does not have a beneficiary, anything that is not set up in a trust. Um, so your, your, your average checking account, your average um, brokerage account, your home, all of those assets pass through probate. And what that means is uh, someone needs to go to court and apply to either be your executor according to your will or to be uh, the administrator of your estate. And all of that process is public. All of your potential heirs will receive notification uh, of uh, you know, your, your, what, what was in your will or what your assets are. And all of those people will have the right to ask questions. So that process is very public. Uh, there are expenses associated with it. There are significant delays associated with it. And so for some people, when they're putting their affairs in order, avoiding probate uh, is, is a, a primary goal. You may also want to very simply make asset transfers to your heirs, simple and straightforward. Uh, if your, your situation is very simple um, and you don't have a, a, a lot of, of assets to take care of, that can be a, um, a, a very straightforward and inexpensive process to just make sure that assets are, are set up in such a way that they pass directly to the heirs that you want them to go to. Uh, now, I, I, I name these, this list of values and goals as if they are mutually exclusive, but they're not. For many people, there's a combination of these goals uh, that you want to address when you're putting your affairs in order. Um, to continue, the other thing that you that you need to do is to make sure that you have the legal documents that you need to address the goals that we just talked about. Um, often, someone you know, I'll have people at, tell me, I you know, I don't have a lot of assets. I'm still quite young. Uh, I have I have kids in a in a house and really nothing nothing too uh, too significant yet. I've just started on my um, on my uh, uh, retirement planning and then putting money away for retirement. Do I really need a will? And the answer to that is yes. The thing that I just said about that person's situation that definitely requires a will is the fact that they have children. So you definitely, if you have children, want to name a guardian for who those, you know, who, who you want to be the guardian for your children. If you don't, the decision is made in such a way that may or may not end up, your, your children may or may not end up where you want them to. Um, Another example is it, most people are not aware that if they don't have a will in New York State and they pass away, and let's assume that one of your children has predeceased you, that predeceased child's children have rights to some of your uh, estate. That may be what you intended, but it may not. That's just one example of what happens if you don't have a will. There is a default will that New York State imposes if you don't have a will. And it is important to know what the provisions of that default will, uh, which is what we refer to as uh, the um, uh, intestacy regulations. Um, important to know what would happen if you passed away and didn't have a will. Uh, so that's something to be aware of and to address. And for most people, it means that yes, you do need a will. Trusts are another question that, come, that comes up uh, frequently. I have people ask me, well, do I need a trust all the time? The answer to that is, you, it depends. I'm sorry, I, have to, I had to say it again. Um, it depends on your situation. For some people, a trust is a very, very elegant way of avoiding probate. Uh, it can be a very straightforward way of keeping your estate private. Um, it can be very, very helpful in estate planning for a situation where you have lots of heirs. So if you are, you know, if you're passing away and, and you're the uncle, you don't have, you don't have children, but you've got 25 nieces and nephews, for example, and I definitely have run across uh, families that have more than that, um, going through the probate process for your executor would be extremely painful. By setting up a living trust, you would avoid that completely. So there are a, a, a wide variety of reasons why a trust might be useful. Having said that, where trusts are um, where trusts are not necessary, my philosophy is to to set up 
someone's estate in such a way that assets go where you want them to go uh, with the least expense and with the least complication. So the more straightforward, the more easy it is, not only for, for you, but also for your executor and for your heirs, the better. So there are, there are ways of setting things up where you don't need a trust that are much more simple and straightforward. Where that is the case, that is definitely my, uh, my philosophy about that. Sorry, again, I keep touching the wrong button. Um, so healthcare proxies. A healthcare proxy is a document that gives authority to an individual uh, or individuals to make healthcare decisions for you when you can't make those decisions for yourself. Um, healthcare proxies, again, are very important documents. Um, you want to make healthcare proxies readily available to uh, the, the agents who are going to act in your behalf in the event that you, uh, that, that you can't speak for yourself. Um, powers of attorney. Now, powers of attorney are sort of the opposite, and we'll talk a little bit more about this um, later. A power of attorney is a very, very um, powerful document that lends itself to abuse. It lends itself to someone uh, having access to your assets while you're still alive, uh, but you are incapacitated. Now, if you have someone in your life that you trust completely, for most people, that's their spouse. They, uh, they make their spouse the agent on the power of attorney. Then that's a wonderful thing. That's, that's excellent. Um, you also want to name a successor. And again, if you have someone, for example, one of your children that you trust completely with having that type of access to your assets, then that is also a wonderful thing. But powers of attorney should... You should consider, instead of just a broad power of attorney, you should give some thought to, gee, do I want to do a power of attorney but limit it in some way so that my agents under my power of attorney, for example, can only use it if I'm incapacitated, not while I'm still uh, perfectly capable of handling my own affairs? Or do I want to limit it to specific accounts or to specific types of transactions? Um, another thing to consider when you're putting your affairs in order is ownership of accounts. Who owns your accounts? Is it you? Is it two people? Is it you and your spouse? Is it, have you added a child onto one of your accounts? And is that a good idea? A lot of people uh, set up joint accounts and they're not aware of what that means. Um, a lot of people are under the mistaken understanding that if you put someone on, on an account with you, for example, let's say you do that just before you go into a nursing home, um, that half of that account now is, is safe because half of it belongs to the person who is joint on the account. And you go into the nursing home, they can only access half of the account. The reality is that an account that is joint is 100% owned by anyone who's on the account. So if you have five people on an account, let's say it's you, your spouse, and your three children, any one of those five people can go in and use all of those assets. What that means for nursing home planning is that anyone who is going into a nursing home who is on a joint account, that joint account is considered 100% available to the, the, the individual uh, who is getting care to provide for their care. So there's nothing protected about a joint account. Not only that, but it's 100% available to a creditor. So if let's say in that scenario where you and your, and your spouse and your three children are on a joint account together, and uh, one of the people in that group, let's say one of your children owns a business and goes into debt, goes through bankruptcy, whatever the case may be, because of business, issues, for example, going through this coronavirus uh, pandemic situation, um, the creditors of that child would be able to access 100% of the money that's in that account. So joint accounts can be, uh, uh, can facilitate access to those assets, but that's the good news and also the bad news, uh, because facilitating the access means allowing access uh, to anyone's creditors, right? Um, so also let's think about the ownership of real estate. 
real estate is one of those assets that when you when it passes to the next generation um very often you get a really nice step up in basis so what that means is you may have bought it for twenty thousand dollars and now it's worth two hundred thousand dollars and at your passing it passes on to the next generation without capital gains tax so at your passing your heirs receive it and they at the time that they sell it they don't need to pay taxes on all of that growth in the value of that uh, of that real estate. Um, another feature of real estate is that it's very um, uh, it isn't straightforward for it to pass to your heirs without going through probate. You can put a beneficiary on almost anything, but you can't put a beneficiary on real estate in a in a straightforward manner. Now there is a way of getting around that. There is a strategy that you, that you can use. It's referred to as setting up uh, ownership of real estate um, in life estate. I'm not going to get into that in a lot of detail right now, but planning and preparing and putting your affairs in order uh, gives you the opportunity to consider uh, what you're going to do with your real estate. It's a lot gives you the opportunity to to make decisions about how that is going to pass to the next generation. So I mentioned a minute ago about uh, the step up in basis and, and preserving all of those assets from capital gains tax uh, at the time of, of death. What some people do is make a decision about their real estate that completely eliminates that advantage. So in other words, it makes their heirs have to pay capital gains tax on that asset all the way back to the $20,000 that you paid up to the $200,000 that it's now worth. So they paid capital gains tax on $180,000 unnecessarily. And, and what that is, what that strategy is, is something that is super common. A lot of people um, put their children on their home uh, at, at, in joint name. So they'll title the house to themselves and to the children or they'll title the house, the house just to the children. If you do that, what you're doing is setting up a big capital gains tax bill that's unnecessary at your passing. It's a very common strategy. I see people do it all the time. It's not a good idea. It's a, it's a capital gains tax issue. And the reason that it happens, and, and a lot of lawyers, quite frankly, recommend it. Um, the reason that it happens is that most lawyers are not financial planners and they're not accountants. Uh, and they're not as focused on the tax ramifications of putting some uh, of putting an asset in someone else's name while you're still living. Um, ownership of business, I'm not going to go into that in a lot of detail, but the uh, planning process of uh, when you own business, a, a business and making sure that the ownership of the business is set up properly, uh, making sure that there's a proper succession plan in place is absolutely critical for the uh, for the owner of a business that where they intend to pass that on to their heirs. Um, very important to look at the beneficiaries under your life insurance policies, under your various accounts, under your IRAs, and the beneficiaries under your will. A lot of people are not aware or they're not thinking about the fact that they've got this will that they've that they've written. The will has all these instructions about where they want the assets to go. But if you turn around and look at their, their actual accounts, their IRAs, their life insurance policies, the beneficiaries on the accounts are different than the beneficiaries on the will. And what that means is that if you intended uh, assets that are going through your will, to go to your heirs in a different manner or to different people than on your policies and accounts, that's okay. But usually what, what, what I find is that people didn't intend for the, the beneficiaries on their policies and accounts to disagree or to conflict with the beneficiaries under the will. So in other words, if I name my, my husband and one of my children because I only had one child, as the beneficiary on one of my accounts when I'm younger. Then I have a couple of more children. And then my husband and I decide to, to write our wills. 
and I say, okay, I want everything to go to my husband and then to my children. And if one of my children predeceases me, I want it to go to their, to that predeceased child's children. So I've got it all set up so that it flows down through the generations properly. It doesn't matter because the, if most of my money is in that retirement account where I said it was going to go to my husband and then to one of my children, the rest of my children are disinherited because whatever's on that IRA takes precedence over what's in your will. And a lot of people don't know that. So it's important to take a look at those things and make sure that they're in order. So let's talk about what now, now that we, we have thought about all of these documents, um, what should we then do with them to make sure that they are where they should be uh, if something were to happen to you? You wanna definitely secure your wills and trusts. And the question is, do you want them to be in your home? Uh, do you want them to be with your attorney? Or do you want them to be filed in surrogate's court? It used to be that filing in surrogate's court was the standard uh, operating procedure for um, securing wills and trusts. Um, today, usually, an attorney will have a, um, a safe in their, in their office, um, and they keep wills and trusts um, filed in a fireproof safe. Most attorneys will tell you that it's probably not a good idea for you to keep these documents at home. Documents, especially in this day and age, are susceptible to being altered. They're susceptible to being um, to being uh, falsified, to being uh, you know faked. So um, because we have the technology to manipulate documents the way that we can today, uh, it's a good idea to keep those originals out of the hands of anyone who might um, who might have motivation to alter one of the pages in the document, for example. Um, you want to provide, as I said earlier, and I'm gonna repeat that here, you wanna provide easy access to your healthcare proxies. Um, so you want to have your attorney keep an original and the reason, or at least one original, the reason for that is that if they get lost, you will always know where an original exists in case you need it. Um, you want your agents to have a copy or at least your primary agent to have a copy. Um, your doctor and hospital will want a, uh, if you go to the doctor, you go to the hospital, if you, you're gonna wanna take a copy with you. Uh, they won't need an original, but they will scan in the original in their uh, system or make a photocopy of it and put it in your file. Um, you may also want to keep one handy, like for example, on your refrigerator or near the refrigerator. Um, not so much the healthcare proxy, but the um, uh, if you have a MOLST form, and I'm gonna get into that uh, a little bit further, but if you have a MOLST form, you definitely wanna put that on the refrigerator. Well, let me stop and and and, and say what it is that I'm referring to here. A MOLST form um, is a medical directives form uh, that is uh, a New York State document. It's usually in red. They usually print it out in red. And um, a, an emergency uh, personnel, an ambulance EMT, who arrives at your house if you call an ambulance, will often look on the refrigerator for that document, that they're trained to do that. Um, and the, the, the reason is that it has very, very specific, much more specific than your healthcare proxy, directives about, for example, resuscitation, intubation, artificial um, uh, nutrition, artificial um, uh, hydration. It's very, very specific. It's a form that you fill out with the help of a doctor or nurse rather than with a lawyer. And it's a document that I that I strongly recommend that you keep handy, especially if you're if you're at a stage of life where you're thinking you might you might need a life alert uh, system to you know call an ambulance because you have a medical condition or whatever the case may be. Um, good idea to have your most on your refrigerator. So talking about your wishes regarding oh here you go now I get on the next slide and and there's the most form okay. Um, you're talking about your wishes regarding medical care. 
you're going to want to be very open and very clear with any agents under your healthcare proxy. You're going to want to go over the healthcare proxy with them. Uh, and if you do have a MOLST form, you're going to want to go over that with them as well, because they're going to, they're the person in the absence of, of your ability to make decisions for yourself. They're the person that's going to make those decisions for you with your doctor or other medical provider. Um, you may want to even, you know, put in writing the specifics of what your wishes are, uh, or just give them a copy of the healthcare proxy and the molds. <coughs> Excuse me. I need to stop to take a drink of water because when I talk too much, I I get dry. Excuse me. Okay, so the other thing that you can arrange in advance, of course, is the disposition of your remains and your funeral arrangements. <coughs> you can specify the disposition of your remains in your will, and a lot of people do this. I actually recommend that, I mean, you can certainly go ahead and do that, but you definitely want it to be on your healthcare proxy. The reason for that is your will often isn't opened until you've been gone for a couple of weeks. The healthcare proxy is there in the moment and available when you are receiving medical care or end of life, end of life care. Um, therefore, that is uh, where you definitely want to have that information. So the kind of information that you might want to have is things like if you have a strong feeling about for, for or against cremation or burial, that's a good place to, to make that clear. Uh, if you want to donate your remains to science or to, you know, to UB, um, or if you want to uh, um, be an organ donor, your healthcare proxy is a good place to note that. Um, if you have a specific place that you would like for example, you want to be cremated and, and it's always been your dream to have your ashes you know, spread over uh, whatever Pikes Peak or whatever, you know, mountain, lake, stream. Um, your healthcare proxy is a good place to, to express that wish. You can also uh, uh, discuss what you um, prefer in regards to funeral arrangements. Um, you can make specific requests about whether you want uh, a, a, a service of some type. Um, you can refer to any prepaid or pre planned funeral arrangements that you already have. So, the other thing that, uh, that you need to sort of marshal and have, uh, have information uh, gathered about are the following the, uh, your bank accounts, your investment accounts. I put stocks in bold here on purpose because that is the number one asset that uh, has a tendency to wander. Uh, if you have actual stock certificates, you definitely want to make make it clear where they are because otherwise, the, the, a stock certificate is is kind of like having cash. If you don't have a record of the the registration number on the stock certificates and you don't have the actual stock certificates available they can end up getting lost and uh, those assets can end up not being claimed by your heirs. Um, retirement accounts, of course, uh, including your pensions and any annuities. Um, you want to have information about your life insurance, your health insurance, uh, any long-term care insurance that you have. You want to have the policies. And, and I also bold the word certificates here for a reason. Uh, very often people have life insurance through their, um, and, and long-term care also, by the way, through their employer. And after they retire, they continue to have that, that life insurance. And you don't have a policy. They never gave you a policy. The policy is actually owned and held by the employer. You will have a certificate that they will have given you at one point. And if you don't have it, and you know that you have life insurance through a, through a former employer, you may want to get a copy of the certificate and put it with your important papers. Um, because again, that's another asset that I don't infrequently see 
um, getting lost and and uh, not ending up paying out to heirs. It ends up after a certain period of time, it gets paid to the state. Uh, you want to have access to the deeds to your real estate. Uh, you want to have any business documents, the, the formation documents for your for your business, uh, any contracts, anything along those lines. Uh, you want to have the titles to your vehicles and you want to have credit card and mortgage statements and you want to keep them up to date. Anything you know, you want to have basically your most recent statements for all of those. Uh, if you have a sort of a, a, a binder with all of this information in it uh, or a box, um, that is very helpful. Other documents that you want to have um, are your marriage certificate, your birth certificate, your social security card, a driver's license or a copy of the driver's license, military discharge paperwork, and any certificates of naturalization. I, again, I bold the military discharge paperwork for a reason. Um, if you are someone who has been in the military uh, and served during the time uh, during a time of uh, of war, you are eligible for um, a, uh, a pension through the VA that some people aren't aware that they're that they're eligible for, and if you or your spouse um, needs nursing care or assisted living type care, um, assistance with the, with the activities of daily living, then you are uh, eligible for aid and, aid and assistance uh, benefits from the VA. So if you pass away and you were active military uh, during a time of war, your military discharge paperwork can be very, very helpful to your spouse if he or she ends up needing assisted living or in-home care uh, because it may um, give them a, a significant monthly benefit to help for that care. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your online presence. Um, do you want your Facebook account to live beyond you? Some people do, and I, I have, um, I know people from, you know, from my personal experience that have passed away and their Facebook account lives on. And on the anniversary of their death, on their birthday or whatever, um, their friends, relatives, children, whatever, post to that account, um, sort of, you know, uh, thoughtful comments or something along those lines. That's lovely, but you may or may not want that. And if you don't want it, then you, you know, should definitely let uh, someone know that you that you don't, and also make access to those accounts uh, to shut them down available. Because if you don't leave passwords to someone, uh, they won't have access to get on there and shut them down. Um, your Automatic payments and subscriptions that you're doing through apps and online. Uh, if you're subscribing to, you know, um, uh, various apps on your phone, whether it's games or or um, uh, accounting software or you know whatever the case may be on your phone, again, access to those uh, subscriptions and to the uh, you know with with the um, passwords is going to be very important. For your uh, for your your heirs and your whoever is handling your executor, for example, uh, to take care of. Again, online access to your credit cards, to your bank accounts, to your investments, those all need to be shut down. So putting it all together, uh, in other words, how do we keep, you know how do we keep track of all of this? Well, basically, you want a, a binder, a folder, a box. And in that, you want uh, contact information for your lawyer, absolutely, because some of those original documents should be living in your lawyer's safe. Um, you're going to want a, a, a list of the documents that your lawyer has so that they know what they're looking for, or just a copy of those documents that are, that where the original is in your lawyer's possession. Uh, you want the whereabouts of any other legal documents that are in your possession, uh, definitely things like powers of attorney, where are they? 
uh, so that they can be sort of marshaled because people, uh, you know, even though a power of attorney is no longer valid after you pass away, someone has a power of attorney, they do sometimes uh, go and use them when they find out that you've passed away. They use them before the bank knows that you've passed away, for example. Um, you want to have a copy of the healthcare proxy in the most. And again, as I said, especially the most probably wanted to have that on your refrigerator in addition to a copy of it in the binder or folder. Um, and a note regarding your funeral and bur burial wishes. By the way, some people, and this was true of my own mother, had in that box a um, um, notes in regards to what she wanted for even things like flowers at her funeral and um, songs she wanted played at her funeral. She had uh, also um, information that she wanted us to include in her obituary. You can leave all kinds of information for people, whatever is important to you. You want to have a list of all your assets with the financial institution, the account number, and the contact information for the financial institution and any advisor that you've been working with. Um, you want a copy of all your miscellaneous documents that I discussed earlier, marriage certificate, uh, um, military discharge documents, that kind of thing. Um, and you want an information on your online accounts of where to find usernames and passwords. You can put it in a safe, you can put it in a safety deposit box. Those are, those are good, uh, good places and there should only be you know, a limited number of people of course, who have access to that information. Uh, last but not least, you want to update that information regularly so that you know if, if you change your will, you don't want to have in your in your in your box um, your outdated will. You want to have in your box the, the 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 latest will. But it's also a good idea to have a copy of that old will in there that is literally destroyed. So torn in half with a note on it in your handwriting that says, I destroyed this, this is no longer my will and the date and your signature. Um, good idea to leave a record of how to find this information with your lawyer, with your spouse, in your safety deposit box or in a safe. Um, you could, or all of the above actually. Um, you know, I would recommend that you leave your your record of this information with your lawyer um, and also with your spouse at the very least. Not a bad idea to also have it in either a safety deposit box or a safe. Um, as it says on this last slide, you can feel free right now while we're still uh, online to ask me questions. Um, I'm sure Katie will pass those on to me. But also feel free to give me a call or email me with any questions that you might have. Um, I do uh, a free initial consultation for anyone who contacts me from this forum. And uh, I'm perfectly happy to, uh, to have a conversation with you or to answer any questions you might have. Thanks, Valerie. Um, we Thank do you. have a couple of folks calling in. So would you mind reading off your phone number and your email for them, please? Uh, not at all. My phone number is 716-913-0509. And my email address is V as in Victor, S as in Sam, T as in Thomas, A, N as in Nancy, E as in Edward, K as in Kilo, at E, S as in Sam, Q, C as in Charlie, F as in Frank, P as in Paul, dot com. Okay, thank you. Yes, we do have some questions and comments here, so I will get started. Uh, the first thing I'm seeing is, what is the approximate or average cost of the estate planning process? It's very difficult to average it because, uh, <laughs> as always, it depends. Um, you know, and it also, it depends, first of all, on the lawyer, <laughs> uh, but it also depends on how complicated it is. So, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, wills tend to be not too, not, not too bad, depending again on who, on the lawyer that you go to. I can answer you for myself. Um, 
If I am doing a will for an individual, I charge $400 if it's just a straightforward will. Uh, if it's for uh, a uh, couple, um, it is $750. So a little discount if it's two of you. Um, and that includes the healthcare proxy and power of attorney. That's part of the whole, what I refer to as a will package. Um, trusts can run anywhere from $1,200 to six, $7,000 um, are the, so far the trusts that I have done in my life. Uh, however, I have seen trusts um, <clears throat> That have uh, that have been, you know, for, for for more complicated situations and with attorneys who, you know, who are are uh, working in large uh, downtown law firms. I've seen them, you know, run up into the 30, 40, $50,000 range. But again, those are very complicated trusts. By the way, there are trusts that are that are free that I throw into the will. <laughs> um, one example is a pet care trust. If you want to name who's going to take care of your pet and leave a little money to that person or or just name who's going to care for your pet that actually is a trust um and it's just a little paragraph in your will and, and I, I don't charge to do that kind of little baby trust that gets put into the will thank you valerie next question how often should i be reviewing my estate planning docs you should be reviewing your estate planning documents um at least every two years, I would say, but every single time there's something major that changes. So you want to go back through the whole, you know, just kind of look through your, your, your documents whenever you, let's say, you move your, your assets from one place. Let's say you change financial advisors. You're going to want to go through and get rid of all the contact information for your for your previous financial advisor and put in uh, the, the information for the new financial advisor, like that. So whenever there's a major change, let's say there's also, <clears throat> excuse me, a major change, let's say you get divorced, or let's say you um, uh, have another child, or you, know, you sell your business and, and retire. Uh, all of those life event um, changes uh, should necessitate looking through uh, your documents and making sure everything is still up to date. Okay, thanks, Valerie. Mm -hmm. uh, we have two questions about the most here. I'm just going to combine them. What does it stand for again, and where do you get one? You know what? I can never remember what it stands for. The first word is medical. <laughs> Six um, medical orders for life sustaining treatment. Thank you so much. I knew that uh, Katie would always be there to help me. Um, the, uh, where you get one, you can actually Google it and download one. They are, uh, available kind of readily, uh, online from various, there, there are various sources that will, you know, that, that will pull it up. It's a New York state document. I expect through New York, you could probably find it on New York state gov. But if you just Google MOLST New York, it will. It will come up uh, because if I need one from one of my clients, that's how I get it. Okay, thanks, Valerie. Next, I'm seeing is you mentioned that there are capital gains tax ramifications to make children owners of your home, but isn't it advantageous to not own the house if you need long term care? They can't take the home. Absolutely, that's exactly correct. Um, but there's a way of doing it without putting them on the house uh, in in joint name. You put them on the house in joint name. There are there are several disadvantages to that. Um, or by the way, if you put them on the house in joint name, the house is still considered 100% available to you. So the house is still uh, not protected. You would have to put your children on the house and take yourself off. Uh, so then you do you no longer own the house. That is that can cause all kinds of problems, including of course the capital gains tax. Um, if your children end up having creditors, you can lose the house that way. Um, or you can also just lose your star exemption. So if you get a star tax break and it's your children's name that, that are on the house, you may lose that star tax break. In fact, very, very likely you will lose at least a portion of it because a portion of it is based on age. So 
there are definitely problems with that, but there is a way to um, there, there is a way to address it and minimize the, the downside and maximize the upside. And that is to set it up in life estate. I do a lot of life estates for families. Uh, it's not always appropriate for you, but very often it is where what you're doing is setting it up legally. So you own the, the only part of the home that you own as the original owner is the value of the house or the legal right to the house from now until your death, and at the moment of your passing, your children become the owner of the owners of the house. Uh, if you do it that way, you preserve the capital gains tax advantage, and you um, you eliminate the the issue that their creditors could could attach the house. You also eliminate the problem with the star exemption. So um, using a life estate is a much more effective. Uh, approach rather than putting your children's name on the deed. Thanks, Valerie. I almost wonder if that would be its own class, like what you should know before transferring property or something like that. You know, I actually I have a class like that. It's basically, you know, tra uh, transferring assets. Uh, the the pros and cons of various ways of transferring assets is uh, one of one of the classes that I do through University Express, actually. Well, I'm sorry I had a mind slip, but I'm making a note of that for spring as a potential. Yep. Cool. Okay, next thing I'm seeing. Oh, can this presentation be accessed again? We are recording it, and I'll try to post it on the website by Monday or Tuesday. Uh, next question. We had our wills written in 1985. What's involved in updating and including grandkids? Thank you, Valerie. Um. If your wills are from 1985, very likely uh, redoing them is 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 probably in order to include the grandchildren. Um, you would you know you you would basically write new wills. It would be the best way to do it. Um, now you can just put a codicil to the will. That's less expensive. But I expect that if we were to review the wills, there might be some other things that uh, you know that we would want to uh, add or change. If that were not the case, if you didn't you know, if, if the only thing that needed to happen is is grandchildren added to the will, then we could do it through a codicil. A codicil is only like for, to do it for both wills is, is going to be somewhere in the order of, of three to four hundred dollars total. Good to know. Thanks, Valerie. Then I'm just seeing uh, one last comment here is you've given me a lot to think about and review. Good. <laughs> that was the that was the objective. Oh, and actually one more. Okay, one just came in. We do not currently have wills, but do not plan to stay in New York State for more than a couple more years. Should we wait until we move to get a will made? Wills are uh, the, the states, regardless of where you do a will, uh, the states recognize the validity of, of, of a, a, a will from another state. Um, so I would not, I would not wait a couple of years if you're moving out of state because heaven knows what's going to happen in the next 2 years. I would definitely get that taken care of. Um, you won't need to redo them when you move. Unless there's something in the will that that changes, but in that case, you would have to redo them in New York as well. All right, thank you, Valerie. And now I'm just seeing a couple thank you comments. So, Valerie, as always, thank you for sharing your expertise with us. We greatly appreciate you and to everyone who's on. Thank you for your time and we will see you next time. I hope everyone stays well and stays safe. Sounds good. Thanks, Katie.